Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, just by way of background, um, I'm not a Web 2.0 expert. Um, in fact, I only know what I know, which isn't a great deal compared to probably every one of you in this room. Um, my background, as I said, is as a, as a journalist, worked in the radio, commercial radio industry for 15 years, uh, initially as an announcer, playing songs, and um, got a bit bored with that, and was also told by the odd boss I wasn't that good at it. So um, I took their uh, word for it and became a, a radio journalist and uh, travelled the country, worked um, in places such as uh, Bernie in Tasmania, uh, Cooma, when the Threadbow landslide happened, I was a local radio journalist here. Um, does anyone remember the Canberra Hospital implosion? Um, I was a journo for 2CC on the roof about from um, probably meeting you away from the lady that did the plunder who won the competition on Mix 106.3 to kill somebody. Not that she knew that was going to be the case. Um, so I've been around the traps and worked at 2UE in Sydney with Lawsy and Jones and all those sort of, you know, egos on sticks and Ray Hadley and so on. So. Um, that's my background. My experience in, in, in Web 2.0 was essentially updating the TUE website with news headlines, which was simply typing in the first paragraph of the top three stories I'd written when I was editing the shift and then hitting publish in a window. How it all worked, I didn't know, and if it didn't work, I'd just ring someone and say it didn't work and leave it at that. Um, so I made, made the decision to uh, join emergency services um, almost 10 years ago now. I was working at Mixon 104 as the uh, news director and um, senior editor doing the breakfast news and was frustrated as hell about the lack of information that was coming out of the organisation that I work for now, um, which was different then, as well as the police. I just um, didn't understand why they weren't telling the public what was going on. And I thought, well, here's a challenge. So I actually resigned from the job for a three month contract and I'm sure some of you in the room have probably done things like that before, and uh, just thought, well, if I'm good enough, I'll get the job when they advertise it, and if I'm not, well, I'll go back to radio. Um, don't really care. I, I, I just want to see if I can um, make a difference, which sounds all very nice and fuzzy, but that was actually how I felt at the time. Ten years later, I'm very happy to say I have been managed, uh, have managed to make, make a, a difference personal opinion. Um, you can be the judge whether um, that's the case or not. So we'll start by going back with a bit of, uh, bit of a history lesson. On January 18, the day that I suppose defined our city when it comes to responding to emergencies, um, the ESB as it was called then, effectively had no media communications unit, um, no whole of government links, um, so ESB didn't really know how to call in back up from or across government and government didn't know how to coordinate it and make it happen. And there was very limited connections with the Canberra-based media, as I said. As the news director at Mixon 104, I never heard anything from the Fireys or AMBOs or SES or RFS. So if something was going on, we weren't told about it. Um, so what actually happened on the day? Well, of course, ESB were overwhelmed. The only media communications, and I'm talking about online media release writing, all that stuff, was the PA of the ambulance chief who wrote the odd media release on the side when she was asked to. And she had no formal training in that. She was, she was a PA. Not her fault, that's just the circumstances she was in. Um, support staff scrambled, but you know, we're pretty unfamiliar with uh, the challenges that a major emergency like the bushfires um, presented. Of course, unable to meet the demands of not only the local media, but the national media and international media that, that was occurring uh, because of that. And as you all would have um, heard, and maybe personally have this feeling as well, if you were affected by the fires with your own property or family, is why weren't we warned? Which was a, a fair enough question. I still get that question to this day from people. And even when I tell them what's in place, they still, some of them who were badly affected, say, why weren't we warned? Uh, I was responding to emails. We had about three emails over, 300 emails over two days when we had the elevator fire weather back in January. And I stayed back at work till 10 o'clock on two nights to clear them because I didn't want them to bank up and become part of a usual bureaucratic process which then would lead to more criticism about why it's taking so long to respond and so on. And this one gentleman, he, he obviously was quite, quite upset, so I decided to ring him. Bad move by a public servant, but anyway, you live and you learn. 
he proceeded to abuse the hell out of me for about 20 minutes and in the end I just hung up. I wasn't going to convince him. Um, and I didn't mind hanging up because he thought my name was Gary so he was going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a Gary here, you know, you must be off your meds, mate. So um, I, didn't, I didn't tell the boss that, so can we edit that bit out? Um, so what happened immediately after um, January 18 is a whole government response was required. That was pretty obvious. Uh, external expertise was brought in. Um, staff were struggling to cope with the workload and there was obviously serious fatigue and morale issues. So then we got people like David Marshall um, and Jeremy Lassick who came in and tried to steady the ship and did a pretty excellent job in, in those um, trying circumstances. And then, of course, you have the inquiries and coronials and all that sort of stuff, of which there were a number. Uh, essentially, they all came up with there need to be additional resources in this area, uh, a greater focus on the provision of, um, of, of it. Um, the system should be improved. In our case, that actually means having a system, of which there wasn't. Um, there was a fax machine, and guess what? It didn't work. Right at the height of when they wanted to issue a warning, so to speak. A greater coordination across government, and so the messaging is, is all coming out uh, from one, one location. There's no confusing messages. Um, we build the relationship with, uh, with the media. Um, we get to know them, they get to know us, we know their business well, and things just happen because we're, we're that tight. And the engagement of an experienced media director, um, for some reason that was me. Um, so how did we respond to the lessons? Uh, initially, it was all about people, plans, and uh, as you know, in our business, there's a lot of salespeople that have the next best thing. And if you pay us $450,000, you can have it. Um, in fact, there was one product that was used for intranet and then eventually extranet, which uh, they spent about $4.5 million on and we quietly killed it a couple of years ago um, and introduced what I'm now about to um, show you. Once again, that one didn't sort of really become too much public knowledge, but see if people want to look for it. So I was appointed, um, and the reason I was appointed is because of my background in, in media, and they, they made a conscious decision that they wanted to appoint someone with that expertise as opposed to a web expert or a community education expert. Um, we've developed strong relationships with the ACT media. Um, not a day goes by where I and my team don't talk with most um, major players in the media. Um, and when there is bad weather coming that we know in advance, we have the conversation and say, this is what we're expecting, this is what we're being told, this is what we're doing. And they in turn, for instance, triple six go, okay, well, if Friday is going to be really bad, assuming it's Wednesday, we'll roster on extra staff to stay on to cover that scenario. And then if the forecast comes through and goes, oh, no, we got it wrong, it's not going to be that, we'll ring them and say, look, they've downgraded, so you may as well stand those staff down. So that's how closely we um, work together now. Um, there are additional resources appointed. Instead of having um, nobody, there's myself, one media liaison officer, and Richard, our website developer. So we're a massive team, but there's three more than we had back in uh, January 18, uh, 2003. Uh, Chief Minister's Department appointed a Director of Communications, uh, who is Jeremy Lassick. Um, and he becomes, and his role becomes, the public information coordinator during a major emergency. So at the end of the day, the buck stops with him to make sure ACT government collectively get all their messaging out, whether it be relating to hospitals, water, so on. And then to go with that, there's actually a whole of government communications network established and then a plan, um, which is called the CSIP in short, but I won't go into the um, boring details of that too much. We established the ESA as the single point of truth for information for the community on bushfires and other emergencies. So during a major emergency, instead of ACT Health putting out something about health-related issues and TAMS putting out about road closures and so on and so on, it all comes through ESA, through our media team, and then all goes out through there and is approved by one person who's the incident controller. So no more of this multiple messages, scattergun approach and conflicting information and so forth. It all comes through one point and then goes out through one point. Uh, we do regular exercising and training, which wasn't happening beforehand. Um, we do campaigns now that are actually targeted and someone actually thinks about them and they actually give us a little bit of money to do them. Um, enhanced technology and the adaption of social media obviously is improved and more timely messaging. And 
very much so the establishment of purpose-built uh, facilities at our new headquarters at Fairburn, where we have a public information coordination centre facility, um, which uh, at the moment wasn't built as that, but is about to be uh, knocked down and built in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then we also have our fully fitted out media briefing room and um, radio studio. Uh, I won't go into the details of the CSIP because I don't want to bore you all, but I'm happy to provide copies of it to anyone. It's a, it's a public document. Uh, but basically what it does, it, it outlines what the arrangements are if a major emergency happens. Now, our relationship with the media, as I said, is extremely important. We have the MOUs, but they're not worth the paper they're written on if we don't actually, um, I suppose, act in the spirit of them on a daily basis, which is why we alert the media and the community to information about incidents. It may be a two-car MVA that's not overly special, although it is to the poor buggers that are actually um, cut, stuck in the cars and have to be cut out, but essentially, um, we need that process to be working all the time so when the big emergency happens, there is trust and credibility in that information coming out. It's not like, oh, here's some major emergency announcement from the ACT government. Oh, I wonder if this is real or a hoax or... Did anyone see uh, the other day a zombie attack in a TV station in the US somewhere? I can't remember the state, but... Yeah, and four people apparently rang the station and said, oh, is that true? <laughs> hmm, OK. Well... Well, with what's on TV these days, you never know. Zombies may exist. I can't say I've seen any evidence of it, but, yeah, you never know. Um, so how do we use processes and technologies to our advantage? And this is getting to the crux of what we do now and how we've improved things. Um, I have developed, uh, along with my team, a process called the SPOT, or the Single Point of Truth. Um, essentially, this diagram shows you how the process works, and you can tell I've done this diagram as opposed to Richard. It would be a lot more polished and flash. Uh, and I think, uh, no, I didn't do this in Publisher. I did it in something equally as um, horrible. But I wanted to do something to dis explain to you what it actually is. So essentially you get the emergency incident happens, our emergency response agencies, and our media and social media areas will find out about it. Now, we'll find out about it usually by triple zero calls or automatic fire alarms. But you do get calls to media outlets saying, oh, we've heard such and such, and we haven't actually told. What people do, this is <laughs> strange, but people do this, they see an emergency, they don't ring triple zero, they ring the media. And say, why haven't you told us about this big X, Y, Z? And then when they ring us and we go, well, nobody's told us, can you tell them to ring triple zero? Um, so that happens. Uh, and, of course, you get that same thing now on Twitter and Facebook and uh, even YouTube um, where people video something as it, as it happens and then uh, publish it up and it has the same effect. So The only difference in a major emergency, so that was day-to-day, -day, is we add just one in extra box that all the information from across government and ACT policing, who aren't technically an ACT government agency but they're a... Um, they're a, a contractor, but they're providing a service to the people of the ACT. All that feeds back into the same process. So the information comes in, oops, see that there, um, comes into the spot, which is myself and my team, whoever the duty officer is at the time. They verify the information, prepare it, get it approved, and distribute it in one single touch. And when they distribute it, it goes to all those places. You might be able, not be able to see them essentially, but it's, it's all the media. Social media, um, ministers, ministers, officers, staff, other government directorates, basically anyone. How do we do that? We do that through our application we call the Spot app. Now, this is some screenshots. This is an online application we've built. It's an internal application. We don't, um, we don't provide many details on how it works or where for obvious security reasons. We don't want people hacking in and sending out false alerts. Um, and trust me, we've tried it. Um, so essentially, it's, it's very simple. I said to Richard, why can't we do this? And he came back very quickly and said, we can, and we built it. You open up the app. We have a live feed 
coming from our triple zero call centre of current incidents that are occurring. And when I say current, I'm talking about all fire incidents and motor vehicle accidents. We don't have the ambulance jobs because there are privacy issues that we're still working through on that. And hopefully we can one day be able to display that information as well as storm and flood jobs. Once again, that's a technological issue to do with how the information is currently logged. So, yep. It's available on any mobile device or desktop device, but I, uh, only for a select you know people that have access to it. But yeah, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you're online, you can get to it. And it's been built with that in mind. So for instance, you can click on any of those incidents, and that's the level of detail. You may have seen that on our website, a current incidents map. So it's essentially taking a screenshot of that. And that's the level of information the community are getting from that. Now, if that's something that warrants us actually issuing an alert, i.e. providing more information than just it's a, a basic car accident, then what we do is click on uh, write alert next to that specific incident. If it's not listed as one of those incidents, we just hit write, and then it comes up with this screen here. And so we simply put in the title, write the text of what the alert or the update is, and then hit send. Now, for things such as fires, where there's a national warning system and a set of words agreed to what fires will do under certain conditions, we've built in templates. So rather than having to type out the templates all the time or cutting and pasting from a Word doc or whatever, which has its own inherent problems, we just pick the template. And then what that does is then gives you a whole lot of options to uh, fill in the blanks. So then we go in and fill in the blanks or pick the appropriate um, field and then you hit generate alert just underneath that it says there it is you quickly scan and make sure there's nothing out of place that you don't wish to have in there and then further down the page you uh, you simply hit send alert and out it goes and within five seconds it appears on the front page of the esa website goes to uh, all the media the polys canberra connect call center um, our twitter and facebook accounts in fact, Facebook is a little bit longer because we use Deliver It, isn't it, Richard? And, well, they're not particularly um, keen on necessarily everything getting out within seconds like we are, so it can take a little bit longer for the Facebook stuff. And you see there we have tags and categories, which we can add to on the run if we need to, but um, in the major emergency stuff, we, we tag incidents to make it easier for people to find by default. Every alert or update we send out goes to um, those three groups, the website and social media, email and SMS, but we can manually untick if we don't want it, a particular one. And then emergency warning is what we call the health freezing over category. That's when I want the bosses of the media outlets and so on to be aware that we've issued this information so they can check to make sure their staff are responding in a way that we agree under our MOU is, um, is appropriate. And then what it does, I don't have a screenshot of it, but it comes up with a... Um, a report with ticks and crosses to show there's been any failures and if there are failures obviously we can follow them up straight away and essentially we just follow that same process again and again and again so here's how it appears on the front page of the website this is unlike any other website that any other emergency service in the world runs and I've looked at a lot of them and generally typical web people don't like it because it doesn't necessarily meet their idea on how you actually do a website. But the feedback from the public is consistently and overwhelmingly they love it because it's simple. They know they just go to the home page, they're going to get the latest um, alerts and that goes further down the page. And if it's something a bit older, they click on archive and they take their pick from the whole laundry list of stuff. So it's access to information quickly and simply. If it's not on there, then we either haven't issued anything on it or um, it, it hasn't happened. It's, it's not something that's occurring. Also with the uh, current incidents page, the home page is our most popular page on the website, followed by this page, and then there's daylight for everything else. There is a, another field down here when we've issued an alert or an update and then links you to the, to the alert or update, so the commentary. The way we see it, these alerts are just the basic tip-offs there's something going on. When we issue an alert or an update, 
we're essentially like Ray Hadley commentating a game of football. We're actually commentating to the community. We're putting it into context of how, what they need to know and how it may impact on them. Then, of course, our Facebook page, where it appears, and uh, Twitter as well, but I won't um, bore you with those things. You can look at them yourself in your time. Now, the most exciting thing you've all been waiting for, the stats. I've got a few different examples. We had the storm on Australia Day, which may have impacted on some of you here in the room. 50,350 visits between Australia Day afternoon, late that afternoon, and uh, 29th of January. Um, so you can see the stats there, 81,500 page views, average duration, um, just over two minutes. Homepage most popular by a long shot, incidents map nowhere near as popular because the storm and flood incidents currently don't go on the incidents map. Um, traffic sources, uh, which is very pleasing that a lot of people are getting the message to go to our URL, so they're not all necessarily Googling. There's a high percentage of people that actually know the address. And because it's a Saturday, Sunday and Monday, long weekend, mobile traffic accessing our site was 68%. On a day-to-day -day average, it's usually about 50%. Then we had the elevated fire conditions in January. Over that period, from the 8th to the 14th, we had 326,327 visits to the website, which was um, 761,000 page views, so over quarter, three quarters of a million. Uh, and then the top traffic sources there, Google, followed pretty closely by the URL directly. But the visits from mobile was only 41%. That's because most of this happened Monday to Friday daytime hours when I assume a lot of people were sitting at work on, at work on their computers, a lot of people being public servants, sitting there accessing that data. Now, the Mitchell fire that happened a little bit before, on the day that... Ha so that happened late on the Thursday evening. On the Friday morning, we were due, due to go live with our new website. Um, we got a bit busy, as you'd understand, we had Twitter and Facebook set up as accounts, but we didn't have this, we weren't, we made the decision we weren't gonna go live with a new site in the middle of a big emergency. So we went with the old one. So what we had to do is we didn't touch Facebook, but we started using Twitter. So we had to basically assign someone in the pick um, set up to say, right, you're doing Twitter. So they just fed off basically the information we were issuing out and the updates and, and all that sort of thing. Um, and that took us from 1,800 Twitter, uh, sorry, uh, 15 Twitter followers to 1,800 in about three days. So you can see in comparison, um, so there were 69,000 visits to the website over three and a half days during the Mitchell fire. There, there's 326,000. On the Tuesday, I can't remember exactly what the day was, Tuesday the 8th of January, 150,000 visits in one day. And our Facebook um, likes went from 1,800 to 7,000. And that was less than 24 hours. But you'd like to do that every day, wouldn't you? <laughs> Made the bosses happy. Um, now, for the same period, as I said, I talked about the, uh, the Facebook, um, Twitter as well. Um, went from 4,200 to 5,200. So what we saw in that fire um, scenario was a shift from Twitter to Facebook. Now that could be more a, um, I suppose, a reflection of the fact that we were using Facebook more now. Uh, I suppose everyone might have a different opinion, but the fact is that's sort of become quite popular. Um, also, a couple of days later on the Wednesday, Thursday night, there was smoke drifting over the ACT from interstate fires. At um, between 9 and 10 o'clock, or was it 8 and 9, Richard? I can't remember now. 9 and 10, I think. 9 and 10 on that night when the smoke came over and we issued an alert saying, don't panic people, there's no fires, it's the stuff interstate. We had 8,000 visits in that one hour on the website. So to me, that tells me that people are getting the message and they're knowing where to go to get the um, official information. Now, that, of course, doesn't discount. I'm not even including in that the whole crowdsourcing and everybody else's information, but as far as the official um, 
uh, voice or information, then that's what's been occurring. So, did you have a question? Yep. Yep. Yeah, they're continue they're continually dribbling up. Is how I'd probably describe it. Yeah. Oh, I th I thought um, that we might start losing them, but it's just it's dribbling up. So, and I guarantee you, when we have the next whatever incident, they'll just skyrocket up again. Yep. That's a very good question. Uh, in day-to-day -day stuff, it's very casual, and we have messages up on both sites saying these sites aren't constantly monitored and responded to, uh, which concern me greatly, but because we don't have the resourcing for it. Um, but at the end of the day, a wonderful thing is the, the public and, and, and the, um, the crowd themselves, people are putting up negative comments or incorrect information, and just like that, 10 people would go, no, you're wrong, dickhead. Sorry, pardon my language, but <laughs> along, along those lines. That is, and I, I was sort of sitting at my desk during that storm thing going, Wow, that's so nice. Thank you for sticking up for us. You know, I almost felt like getting on and you know saying thank you, we love you sort of thing. Um, what we did as a, as a bit of a trial, and we hadn't done that before, is during the storm stuff, uh, I had a little bit of quiet time because storms generally aren't as intensive for the information because the storms come, they go bang, they hit, and then it's the cleanup, whereas a bushfire is always evolving and you know it could threaten properties on this side of town, then move that way with wind change and so on. So I had a bit of downtime, so I opened up the, con the permissions on the site and said, righto, people, if you've been affected by the floods or if you had one of our crews around to help you out, we'd love to see your pics. Here's one I managed to fluke of uh, a bolt of lightning um, outside earlier and put that up oh, sorry, and shared it, and then people started sending in their stuff, including ones, uh, there was one of a guy who's trampoline, you know, the ones that have the big sort of fence around them, you know, so your kids don't fall off the side and everything. Basically, the wind picked that up and twirled it over many times. It smashed into the back of his house and was upside down. So then I politely said, great photo, and there's, you know, this is an example of why we say you need to tie all loose items down when there's a storm coming, as opposed to duh. Um, so, and look, that guy actually responded back with, yeah, I, I now understand why you mean so. To me, that's pretty effective community engagement that we've actually got the message through to him and probably his immediate um, sort of um, <laughs> network of friends and family because obviously he's going to talk about how the um, trampoline nearly um, wiped out the house or him or anyone else that might have been in that part of the house at the time. Um, just briefly before I finish the site architecture, um, the website is mirrored in both Sydney and Canberra. That was one of our requirements. Uh, we're using virtual servers um, so we can uh, rapidly upscale um, to meet capacity. We have a load balancer that distributes traffic to four virtual servers. Each has eight um, times CPU and 16 gig of RAM. Um, we like open source software. The website's built on uh, WordPress, which we love. Um, and um, the servers are running on Cent OS Linux. And the current configuration of the website uh, at the moment can sustain over 2 million users an hour. Yeah. Yes? And you, when you say mirrored in Sydney and Canberra, you don't mean that there are two mirrors, do you? Or, so there's the original two mirrors or just mirrors in two places? Um, I'll let Richard answer that. Oh, it's mirrored in real time. So it's in two places. Yeah, yeah. Not three places. Uh, four servers, three places. Three yeah. Five. We initially started off with two and then we went up to four and we did we did some load testing with the two, got the results and went, we want more and went up to four. Um, and as I say, we've got the, the cloud stuff as well, which obviously is there available to us. I personally am not prepared to put everything on the cloud and only um, rely on the cloud. In my business, you, it's all about risk and you need to have redundancies and backups. So the system I just went through with the Spot app we have three other backups. We have the backup to that, then we have the backup to the backup, and then we have the backup to the backup, and the backup and the backup. And they're through a variety of means through using um, Gmail accounts, uh, ACT government infrastructure, through Blackberries, um, WebSMS, uh, AAP, 
distribution a whole range of different ways. Because at the end of the day, if we can't get information out, people don't care why not. It's just, Darren, you lose your job and your team because you didn't know what you were doing. Um, and that that's essentially you know critical to the community, not whether I lose my job or not. So um, that's a, a, a pretty important thing for us. And we're constantly monitoring, monitoring that. The site is actually not in a ACT government at all. We went completely outside government infrastructure because we gave them the requirements and they said we can't meet it. And we knew that was going to be the case, but you know we had to play the game and um, the expertise available within ACT government um, leaves a lot to be desired in my own opinion based on my experiences with that organisation. So um, we're now developing in the next stage of the SPOT app is doing a, a, a next uh, not another version, but a complementary app, um, but working in, in the same sort of setup is um, through monitoring social media. Um, so this is just a drawing to give you the basic concept. You've got all your social media. You have a database where it sucks it all in and stores it so we can analyse it after the fact, so we don't have all those issues trying to track down the information afterwards. Then we have a team of um, social media monitors or officers, for want of a better term, and uh, imagine, I don't know, I suppose a, uh, an orange factory where the oranges all come in and you've got a conveyor belt, a line of people who are sorting the oranges. You've got the nice big juicy ones and you've got the, the crap ones for juice and you've got the ones that are all right for the supermarket bags of 10 sort of special and, and you sort it out. Essentially, that's what these people do. And what they do is then uh, basically mark on that tweet, they have an option to send it to any number of locations. It may be to the media um, team looking after responding to public inquiries. It may be to the incident controller. Craig may have just videoed from the front of his house the fire doing certain things. And he puts that up on YouTube or Facebook or whatever straight away. We go bang, straight into the incident controller, up on the big screen as big as this in their room. That gives him a new perspective that he didn't otherwise have. We actually want to harvest what is out there in the crowd, and that's that's um, that's where we're sort of going down there now. To achieve this, as you know, <laughs> there's only Richard, uh, and then we have other resources across ACT government. So um, you guys are the first to know, but I'm actually going to be looking at establishing a team of volunteers, uh, like the RFS have volunteer firefighters, and we have mapping specialists who are uh, volunteers as well, is establishing a team of volunteer social media officers who will assist us in major emergencies. So um, we're looking at doing that in the not too distant future, um, which will help us out greatly, but obviously give other people um, access to some experience they otherwise wouldn't get, especially uh, if you're working in a federal agency that um, deals with what I'd probably term boring information as opposed to stuff like emergencies, which is so fast and ever changing. Not to criticise working in a federal agency, but just, just as a bit of variation. And we've been asked by a number of people already if they can help us, or do you do work experience, or can I, you know, almost trying to offer themselves for a job? Well, we don't have the resourcing for a job, but there's ways and means in which we can do that. And maybe down the track, we can actually combine resources with federal agencies. So, you know, Canberra's a big place. We're, we're all, all work here, we're all affected by it. If there's expertise, then I think we should try and um, tap into it. Uh, that's just a screenshot of how uh, the app sort of as a concept would look on the screen. You'd put in whatever keywords are appropriate and it'll just suck it out. As you know, I don't need to explain how that stuff works. You all know that. And then where to from here? This is essentially the challenges. Um, we need to capture and make constructive use of the data, like I was just saying. Uh, continually make improvements and increase functionality, which is something we talk about all the time. Uh, continue to innovate using the SPOT philosophy. Uh, continue to innovate to meet the ever-changing needs of the community and move with technological advances. So now we're actually, we're, we're level with everything that's out there. We don't want to get behind, which is where we were for the last eight years beforehand and God knows how long before that. So it's staying on top. And the, one of the key things in our business plan is that we move with the technology as it does. And of course that always costs money. Um, can I just ask a very quick question just to get, get a, a view, how much money do you think we spent on building and developing that website and launching it? Forgetting hosting and servers and all that, but just the actual design, building it and all that sort of stuff. 
and obviously you guys have involvement in doing that. Yes. Any other answers? <laughs> Not too bad. $43, which was for a couple of widgets, um, WordPress widgets, that, um, that did what some of the free ones wouldn't do um, for us as far as issuing alerts. And of course, all of Richard's time and expertise, but that's the position. Now, I don't say that to Skype, but I, you know, and as I say, I'm not a, a technical expert, but I see a lot of uh, government organisations and private organisations, they get a salesman come in and go, we can give you a U-Butte system, it'll cost you half a million dollars, blah, 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 you know, chief executive and boards, you know, or, you know, um, secretaries, whatever, finally sign off, and then they go and get this thing out of the box, yet they haven't necessarily done all the work to make sure it actually gives you what you need, uh, and it's, it's just a, a crying shame. Yes. Can you um, tell us about some of the security measures you have around um, the website, given that it's open source? Um, what do you do to ensure uh, you stave off hackers and such like? Uh, I might let Richard get into the technical side of that, but the, the basis of which we've built this website is no information on that site is um, private, it's all public information. So the security. Um, aspect comes from um, stopping hackers from getting in and publishing stuff that we don't want them to publish, like a fake incident or something. Sorry, Richard. Yeah, so we use the internet consistently, uh, firewalls, uh, passwords, keyless, and the security. And we, we do penetration testing on it as well. In fact, we did some, we had some testing done by ACT government IT providers um, recently and where they came back with, they reckon they found some issues and we've actually since proven to them that actually it's not the case, their, their testing they did was flawed because um, they use an, they use automated systems and it shot up all these false positives and things. And of course, when, men, when I'm the person responsible and I get a report saying there are issues, I get concerned straight away, but we've investigated it ex ex thoroughly and got uh, other opinions, and um, it's as it's as secure as we we can make it um, within the, the the budget and things that we have. I, I'm very comfortable. Uh, it's not to say never. Um, look at that was the New York Times recently. So uh, it's 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 always possible, but um, I think it's about uh, in my role taking as much action as that is reasonable. Um, within budgets and confines and so on to actually um, to make it as secure as possible and I'm very comfortable with that. Not that I'm challenging you all here to go back to your offices or home tonight and try and hack it, but and if you can, you find any issues, let me know and I'll happily try and fix them straight away. Wow, is that 35 minutes? Yes. I just noticed the timer. Yes, I, yes, I just thought, oh, there's something a little bit longer. I think we took some questions through, so we might defer questions to the end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let Ben have his go. So thank you very much for that, Darren. Um, a website that only costs $43 can also be a challenge to justified estimates because they just don't believe you. 